to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The weeping prophet of Anathoth said, A horrible and astonishing thing has been happening in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love to have it so. But God asked this, But what will you do in the end? Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. Welcome to our study of the wonderful prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an amazing man of God in a difficult time who took a stand for truth and preached God's message even when people didn't want to hear it and persecuted him for doing so. Every gospel preacher, every Bible class teacher, and every Christian can look up to Jeremiah's faith and trust in God as he taught the Word of God during a challenging, challenging time of Israel's existence. Now, when we think about Jeremiah, his background is very unique in that Jeremiah will always be known as a preacher who said exactly what God wanted said. In our, in our way of saying it, Jeremiah was a book, chapter, and verse preacher. Jeremiah 7, 37, verse 17 is one of the great questions of the Bible. An evil king asked, Is there any word from the Lord? And he knew Jeremiah would say it if there was. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 4, verse 3, Paul repeats, repeats similar sentiments when he says, What does the Scripture say? Jeremiah wasn't concerned about polls or popularity or opinions or statistics. Jeremiah was God's preacher. In fact, Jeremiah 15 verse 16 illustrates just how much Jeremiah loved the Word of God. Jeremiah said, Your words were found, and I did eat them, and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I'm called by your name, O God, Lord of hosts. And so when we think about Jeremiah, he was a Bible preacher. He was one who said what God wanted said regardless of the consequences. You know, when I think about Jeremiah, his background and his history, Jeremiah received one of the greatest compliments in all the Bible. When they came to Jesus, when Jesus asked His disciples in Matthew 16, uh, verse 13 and 14, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? You know what they said? Some say you're Jeremiah. What a great compliment to Jeremiah to even be compared to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this man had a rich, rich history, and yet Jeremiah faced a lot of difficulty. He had a, a strong desire to preach God's Word even in difficult circumstances. In fact, at times it did get to Jeremiah. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 20 verse 9 that he wasn't going to preach God's Word anymore. He was through with the people. They didn't want to listen. He's in prison and they don't want to hear. And then Jeremiah said, His Word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back or forbearing it, and I could not. Jeremiah loved the Word of God, and he was going to let that Word come out no matter what the consequences were. Now, as is the case in our studies of these Old Testament books, one of the things that we want to highlight is their, their practical nature as a living message for today. I understand as well as you do that Jeremiah was written to the people of Israel to help them in a very difficult time as Babylonian captivity is looming on the horizon. God sends this final plea hoping to draw them back. With a book written to help Israel not go into captivity, we have to ask, how does that apply to us? And friends, there are so many good living messages in the book of Jeremiah. For example, Jeremiah's mission and call is a practical living message for us today. I want you to take your Bible and open to Jeremiah chapter 1. Look with me in verse number 10 at the call and the mission Jeremiah has. God says, See, 
I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and pull down, to destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. What a great mission Jeremiah had. He was over the kingdoms, over the nations. God had set him up to preach his message, to tear down that which is wrong and build up that which is right. Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Just as Jeremiah had a divine message and a divine mission, so today we have a message from God that we need to preach His Word, that we need to preach against that which is wrong and ungodly, and that we need to encourage in that which is good and right in the sight of the Almighty. From the book of Jeremiah, we also learn the, the horrible consequences of sin. I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse number 22. As you think about sin, think about these words. God says to the people, For though you wash with lie, wash yourself with lie, and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. Homespun remedies just won't work for sin. That's what God's saying. You can get all the lie and you can get all the soap. Lie is another type of soap. You can get all the soap, all the detergent, all the antibacterial lotion you want in essence. And you can't deal with the sin problem that way. God says your way won't deal with sin. You know, man sometimes tries to figure out his own way to deal with the problems. When it comes to sin, there's only one way. The Lord said in Proverbs 16, 25, There is a way that seems right to a man, the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 14, verse 12 says that same thing. We need to realize that Jesus is the only way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Unless a man is willing to submit to God's Word and God's will and obey the gospel of Christ. It's impossible for that man to be saved. Now, it's good news that you can be saved, but let's realize we can't deal with the sin problem on our own. We need God's help. Do you remember Jeremiah 10, verse 23? Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own path. I can't figure out my own way to heaven. Because of the sin problem, I stand condemned and only by the blood of Jesus, without the, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And yet Jesus made that ultimate sacrifice, Hebrews 9, 22 and Hebrews 10, verse number 12. I want you to then notice about God's people how that they had the philosophy that they could just do it their way and do it whatever they wanted to do and everything was going to be okay. Notice in your Bible, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 30 and 31. The Scripture records for us in Jeremiah 5, verse 30 and 31, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. Well, what is it, Jeremiah? The prophets prophesy falsely, the priests rule by their own power or authority. And here's the really bad thing. And my people, God says, love to have it so. God then asks this question, but what will you do in the end? What a horrible uh, circumstance and predicament this is for the people of Israel. Their religious state is so pitiful that the priests are ruling by their own authority. They don't care. The prophets are prophesying falsely. That's what they want to hear, according to Isaiah 5, verse 30. And God's people want it that way. And then God asked this soul-searching question, but what will you do in the end? All these feel-good messages... All these people who've got their own ways of salvation that you don't even find in this book. Say the sinner's prayer. You've heard Billy Graham mention that thousands of times. Not even in the Bible. All these messages that men have made up, all the altar calls, all the lay your hand on the television. Wait a minute now. People want to hear that. And people like that. What are you going to do on the judgment day when God says, where'd you get that at? 
What are you going to do on the judgment day when God says, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And so while we think about these ideas, please understand what we're trying to stress is, it doesn't matter what man wants. doesn't matter what somebody else somewhere says. All that matters is, what does this book say? The power and the authority is in the Word of God, and we must, we must submit to it. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, verse 18. I'm going to be judged by the words of this book. John 12, verse 48. Because of that fact, we must not add to nor take away. Revelation 22, 18 and 9. And we must not go beyond that which is written. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And so we need to submit to the authority and power of God and never ever put in its place something that we like or something that makes us feel good. You know, as we think about living messages of the book of Jeremiah, one that stands out in my mind for its power and for its encouragement is found in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 16. I want you to take your Bible and look at Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16 with me. Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you'll find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. Look at God's encouragement again. Stand in the way. Ask for the good path, for the old path, where the good way is. That's the way you'll find rest for your souls. God says, I'm pleading with you. Listen to what I'm saying. This is the good way. This is the right way. This is the way of salvation. God's pleading with them to get their life right. You know what they said? They smarted off to God and they said, no, we will not. We'll do it our way anyway. Well, they did. And my friend, they got what their way led them to. Seventy years of harsh Babylonian captivity away from God, away from their beloved temple, away from their homeland. And because of that, they finally got the point and never went back into, into idol worship and ungodliness. But what a hard lesson for those people to learn. Friend, let's learn from their mistake. When God says, stand this way, when God says, walk this way, when God says, this is the good path, walk in it, we need to get in line and say, I'm ready. Hear my, send me. Speak, Lord, your servant hears, just like Isaiah and just like Samuel said. And so let's take the lesson from these wicked people and learn when God says it, that settles it. We just simply need to obey His will. Another lesson that we learn practically from the book of Jeremiah is that sometimes people, instead of going forward, actually go backward in their walk toward God. Notice the example that we find in Jeremiah chapter 7. I want you to look in verses 23 through 28. That's Jeremiah chapter 7. Look beginning in verse 23. God said, But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I'll be your God. You shall be my people, and walk in all my ways that I commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and dictates of their evil hearts, notice this, and went backward and not forward. Because they didn't trust God, and because they didn't put their faith in Him, they wouldn't listen to what God said, and they didn't want to follow His teaching, what happened? God says, you went backward and not forward. You fell away from me instead of drawing closer to me. Friend, if I'm going to go the direction God wants me to, I absolutely must obey and listen to the voice of God. You know, sometimes I hear people say, obedience to God, that's all good and well, but you don't need to be a legalist. Well, when we think about a legalist, obeying God's not a legalist. A legalist, according to Jesus' terms in Matthew 23, was someone who said and did not. Not o Obeying the will of God's not legalism. That's doing what God says. Let me illustrate. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, what? Keep 
my commandments. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? You see, my friend, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. And probably in as clear a language as anyone could describe, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so let's not go backward by listening to what we want, the dictates of our own heart, what others think is good. Let's just simply go to the Bible and ask, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, 17, and when there is, let's read it, let's study it, and let's do our best to follow the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, another practical passage in the book of Jeremiah, and especially relates to many today, is found in Jeremiah 8, verse number 12. I want you to look at what the Scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 12. The Bible says, Were they ashamed when they had committed, committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall in the time of their punishment. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. You know, when you think about the things that aptly fit our society and statements in the Bible that could have just as well been written for our society as any, these words definitely fit. Of the people in the day of Jeremiah, it was said, they don't know how to blush. And friend, how true that is today. What would you have to do to embarrass or make some people ashamed today? Well, it's sure not by the clothes that they wear. For some of their clothes show more than they were ever intended to cover. Can't be by their dress. Can't be sometimes by their actions. Wow, it used to be something that was a shame. Someone being pregnant outside of the marriage. That doesn't bring shame today. People living together, commonplace. You're not going to embarrass them or make them feel ashamed that way. Doing immoral, ungodly things that the Bible specifically forbids. Harlotry, homosexuality, drunkenness. People don't know how to blush today as well, my friend. That suggests to us that we've forgotten what the real standard is, or we've hardened our heart to the point that we just don't care. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 following, the Bible says that some had seared their conscience with a hot iron. Either we're so ignorant of God's will that we don't know it's something we ought to be ashamed of, or we're to the point where we just don't care what God says anymore. Friend, may we never get to that point, and, and may we realize that, that sin is shameful. Sin is embarrassing. Sin breaks the heart of God. And these things ought to bring us to a point of repentance that we may be right in the sight of our God. In the book of Jeremiah, we also learn from Jeremiah about the joy he had in the Word of God. I want you to notice Jeremiah chapter 15, verse number 16. Jeremiah here says concerning the Word of God, Your words were found. And I ate them, and your word, was, your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. What did Jeremiah say about the word of God? It was found. And when he found it, Jeremiah ate it. What's that mean? They took the Bible, and no, he's talking about spiritually. Jeremiah found the word of God, and spiritually they consumed that and put it into their life. Jesus said, hunger and thirst after righteousness. Matthew chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Jesus had earlier said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, verse 4. Job said in Job 23, 12, Your word is more necessary than my daily food. How is it that we find sustenance? By taking the word of God, absorbing that into our life spiritually, and putting it to work. And so Jeremiah said, Your words were found. I ate them. And what was the result? It was the joy 
and rejoicing of his heart. Friend, taking the Bible and putting it to use in your life, it, it's not prohibitive. It doesn't make you restricted and, and not have fun in life. In fact, you'll find no greater joy than living according to the will of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. Philippians 4 verse 4. Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the seat of sinners, nor sits in the path of the scornful, but happy is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Psalm 1 verses 1 through 3. And so let's each examine ourselves as we think about this practical message. And let's ask, are we really taking time to consume the Word of God? Am I studying my Bible like I ought to? The Scripture says, study to show yourself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2.15 The Bible says, search the Scriptures daily. Acts 17 verse 11 I am to be ready always. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 And so do we study and do we really put the Word of God to use in our life so that we can be faithful and live true to the Word and the will of Almighty God? We want to mention again a powerful passage from the book of Jeremiah that shows Jeremiah's fervor, Jeremiah's fervor and his love for Almighty God. Look in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse number 9. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse number 9. Jeremiah said, after he's been left in prison, beaten, he thinks it's time to give up. Then he says in verse 9, I will not make mention of him, nor speak in his name anymore. I'm done with it, Jeremiah says. Now what? Jeremiah says, but his word was in my heart, like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. You know, when I think about this passage and I think about all the things that are going on in this context, Jeremiah had a lot that he could have got discouraged about, and he did a little bit, but he didn't give up. He was thrown in prison for preaching the truth. An evil king slaps him, beats him. Uh, he looks like he might be left for dead, and he says, I'm done with it. These people don't want to hear it. But then he says, you know, I can't do that. Why not? His word was in my heart like a burning fire. Jeremiah had a good case of spiritual heartburn. The Word of God was in his heart, and he just couldn't hold it back. You know, I can't help but think about Luke chapter 24 and those two disciples who walked down the road to Emmaus with Jesus. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 24 that as Jesus spoke with them, their hearts burned within them. There's another case of spiritual heartburn. These men... The Word of God so affected their heart that it, it, it gave unrest. And it, it, it helped them have that desire to do the will of God. There's nothing wrong with being a little pulled on the inside, especially when we're being pulled by the Word of God to do the right thing. When our heart is being pricked, Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when our conscience is being affected by the Word of God, how we need to let God's Word have the power in our life that it does. You know, when I think of the power of the Word of God, I can't help but think of Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse number 29. I want you to notice what the Bible says in Jeremiah 23, verse number 29, about the power of God's Word. God says, Is not my Word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? God's Word has the power to prick our hearts. It has the power to, to affect us spiritually, just as it did Jeremiah and just as it did those two men walking down the road. And it sometimes, though, it can also be like a hammer, crushing that which ought to be destroyed and making that which God wants built up and right in the sight of God. The Word of God is able to build us up. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 32. How are we responding to the Word of God? Are we letting it have that effect that it ought to have on our lives? Now there's one last passage and we've mentioned it many times so far, but I want to emphasize this as we close. I want you to open your Bible to Jeremiah 37 and I want you to see what I believe to be one of the greatest questions in all of Scripture. Look at Jeremiah 37 verse number 17. As Jeremiah speaks with an evil king, the king asks this question because he knows 
Jeremiah well enough to know he'll give a correct answer. Jeremiah 37 verse 17, the Bible says, Then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out, took him out of prison. The king asked him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? Friend, what a great question every child of God ought to ask. Not what do people think, not what do commentaries say, not what's popular or what does my pastor say, rather, what does God say? Is there any word from the Lord? And the good news is, there is word from God. In fact, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In fact, we now have all truth. The Bible says, John 8, verse 32, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus made the promise in John 16, verse 13, that the Spirit would guide the disciples into all truth. And toward the close of the New Testament, we have that once for all delivered faith. Jude, verse 3, tells us exactly that. And so, friend, we ask you today to consider your spiritual condition. Recognize that without God, there's no hope. But at the same time, recognize that if I'll take this book, and I'll do what it says, I'll put it to work in my life, I can be sure that I'm right with God. Have you done what Jesus said? Here's what the Lord said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Have you believed and been baptized so that you can be saved? Mark 16, 16. Have you done what Peter said? Acts 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Did you do what Paul was told to do? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. If you've not done that, we encourage you to do that before it's too late so that we can all know we'll have that great home with God forever. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.